Last week we learned that Christian systems of human priests, whether from liturgical churches or cults, fail to resolve the repent, repeat, sin cycle. Instead, we must give our gifts and our trust to Jesus, and he will lead us and empower us. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, our, our, our desire is to surrender completely our lives to you so that you may empower us and set us on your path, your way, your will. Every day, all day, all the way. And I pray today that the, the words of the author of Hebrews will truly make that path light and clear. Help us to understand and then to walk in obedience in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 7. Hebrews 5, 7 and 8. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him through death. He was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Jesus is our example. His prayers are passionate. Are mine? All parents cringe when their teenage children respond to our counsel with rolled eyes and that horrific word, whatever. God, our Father, likewise despises our whatever prayers. All right, God, I wanted this and I wanted that. But instead, you gave me this mess. You gave me this burden. You gave me this hardship. But God, I love you. Whatever. God despises that prayer just as much as we despise hearing it from our own children. Jesus prayed with godly fear for his father. Do I? There's no room here for demanding prayers. I got to admit, when I was growing up as a young Christian and I'd hear people say, in the name of Jesus, I command this and I command that. They sounded so authoritative to my teenage ears and I enjoyed hearing that. But I would not dare to speak such prayers in my own will and in my own strength. I would only dare say anything close to that if I felt the anointing of God and that it was truly God that was directing the prayer and the words. At the same time, while there's no room for our own human-inspired demanding prayers, neither is there room for faithless prayer. Well, God, I know you're not going to do it, but I pray you will anyway, because that's what we're supposed to pray. Lord, have mercy. Don't pray that prayer. I, I, I think the prime example of a proper prayer is the prayer for salvation. We must first evaluate the horror of our sin. Then we must repent before God. We do well to wait until we sense that forgiveness lifting the sin from us. No, our, our, our salvation's not based on feelings. But brothers and sisters, most of us remember that when we said, God, forgive our, my sin, and, and he did, we could sense that lifting of this sin. The burden was lifted. And, and I, as, as we're praying and helping others into salvation, it would do us well to slow down and, and let them experience and sense the forgiveness of God. I, I always remember hearing about the mourner's bench, the front row of the church where sinners would repent and they would feel the weight of their sin and they would literally, men, grown men, be crying and saying, God, forgive me. But then to see the tears turn to tears of joy as the Lord lifted the burden. Brothers and sisters, 
God doesn't need more friends. But he will raise up the humble. Verse 9, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Beginning with verse 9. And, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him, being designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus' sacrifice was declared worthy. We see it in John 3.16 and then again in Revelation 5.9, John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then Hebrew, or Revelation 5.9, Revelation 5.9, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Back in uh, Hebrews chapter 5, Jesus, in the verses we just read, is equated to the ideal priest, Melchizedek. This king of righteousness received an unsolicited tithe from Abraham. And the promise of non-competition. Likewise, we know that Jesus is the worthy priest. So we give him the gift of our lives. We make him Lord over us. Declaring that nothing will compete with him. Amen. Amen. You know you're dealing with high quality paper when it's hard to turn the pages. Brothers and sisters in the Pacific Northwest, faith practice is weaker than in any other region of the United States. I remember hearing about Sunday Christians, especially in my Midwestern seminary. Here, people will often look at me amazed and say, you mean you go to church every single Sunday? And we're tempted to think we're, we're doing pretty great. But in God's eyes, we might not even be making it. Let these words from Keith Green's song, To Obey is Better Than Sacrifice, minister to our hearts. Again, this is from Keith Green's song, To Obey is Better Than Sacrifice. To Obey is Better Than Sacrifice. I don't need your money. I want your life. And I hear you say that I'm coming back soon, but you act like I'll never return. Well, you speak of grace and my love so sweet, how you thrive on milk but reject my meat. And I can't help weeping at how it will be if you keep on ignoring my words. Well, you pray to prosper and succeed, but your flesh is something I just can't feed. To obey is better than sacrifice. I want more than Sunday and Wednesday nights. Because if you can't come to me every day, then don't bother coming at all. To obey is better than sacrifice. I want hearts of fire, not your prayers of ice. And I'm coming back quickly to give back to you according to what you have done, according to what you have done, according to what you have done. Hebrews 5, verses 11 through 14. Hebrews 5, beginning with verse 11. Concerning this, we have much to say that is hard to explain since you have become hard of hearing. For though by now you should be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and have come to need milk rather than solid food. 
Everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But solid food belongs to those who are mature, for those who through practice have powers of discernment that are trained to distinguish good from evil. And I made reference to this uh, re- in a recent lesson, but there was a study done, and, and this, this has been openly publicized by Willow Creek Community Church, one of the largest secret-sensitive churches in the country. And, and they found that they were great at leading seekers to salvation, but they had failed at discipling new Christians into mature ones. I, I remember speaking to a uh, small group leader at uh, one of our local Assemblies of God churches. It wasn't this one. It was a different one. And uh, he honestly believed. Now, this is one of the leaders in the church. He believed that his church was non-denominational. He didn't even know that it was part of a denomination with a set of doctrinal beliefs. Uh, I remember growing up, I used to listen to Revival Time a lot, and the, uh, the evangelist on the radio was Dan Betzer. And uh, he had a series that he taught on the Holy Spirit. And he said that the series was done at the seventh grade level. And yet often he would present this teaching, usually as four four teachings on the Holy Spirit, and, and people would come to him and tell him how wonderful it was, how deep and rich it was. We often speak of the ABCs of salvation, and, and I, I sprinkle those invitations throughout my Sunday school lessons. We admit we're sinners, we believe in Jesus, we confess our sins. Sadly, We often have to reteach, confess, because even that has been labeled meat by too many pastors. Still, I I would add D, as I said it recently in a lesson, we need discipleship. (laughs) And the following I'm going to list are disciplines of a mature Christian. And they are meant as a final exam. It's healthy to ask ourselves where we might need to grow in some of these. Do I read my Bible every day for at least 15 minutes? I I, I know you'll you'll hear some of the pastors and preachers on the radio. I I just heard one today on uh, YouTube, and he he said that God had led him to uh, pray an hour a day and read the Bible an hour a day, and that's fantastic. But my question is, are we even doing 15 minutes a day of Bible reading? And are we praying 15 minutes a day? Not not two hours total, a half hour total. Do I attend church at least weekly? And I would strongly urge you not only to attend the main service, but to be in one of the small groups, whether it's a Sunday school class or a midweek Bible study uh, the, the Monday night prayer meeting, but to be in at least one small group beyond the uh, Sunday gathering. Do I tithe to the church, giving 10% of my income? And you might say, well, Pastor Tom, it was unsolicited. Abraham just did that, right? It should be unsolicited. You should just do it. And so this isn't a question for you to answer to me. But to God, are you giving a portion? And the scripture leans largely and strongly towards that 10% as as a baseline. Are you giving a portion of what the Lord has blessed you with back to him through his church? Do I pray for and support missionaries and missions? And I am happy to say that in this fellowship, and I I don't mean just the church, but in the assemblies of God, every year we pastors have to reaffirm our commitment to missions when we say we want to continue in the ministry that uh, we've been ordained to. They, They ask, have you committed to missions and are you faithfully supporting missions with your prayers and and as much as you can with your finances. And, and I believe it's so important that not only we leaders do that, but the churches and the people as well. So are you praying for and supporting missions? Do I represent? 
by sharing my faith. And, and you say, well, I don't know how. Look, your story, your testimony, what has God done for you? Plus a couple of Bible verses. John 3.16 is so popular. It's probably one that most have memorized from an early age. And then just to add to that, 1 John 1.9, if I confess my sins, God is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And if you have those two verses, the God so loved verse and the confessed sins verse and a testimony, you can present the gospel. Even the affirmative when somebody asks you, yes, I am a Christian. I remember as a young person in high school, uh, somebody else was asked about that because uh, she had mentioned going to a, a private Christian school in her early years. And they said, oh, does that mean you're a Christian? And she said, well, yeah, but I don't take it too serious. And I thought, Lord have mercy, you know, and I'm not judging, but I honestly, I wondered, is it, is it a real faith or not? Because if my faith in Jesus is real, I'm going to be taking it pretty seriously. Amen. I, I remember as a chaplain, uh, it was young chaplain. It was my first year in the federal prison system, and I was in a unit uh, that was kind of volatile because there were a lot of the inmates receiving medications that helped control their psychology. And uh, the one guy came up to me and was kind of loud. And he, he said, do you really believe all that stuff in the Bible, the miracles and everything? Chaplain, do you believe all that? And he was, he was, he was basically wanting me to answer publicly. And I did. I said, yes, I believe that. And he said, you're the dangerous ones. You're the dangerous one. And I, I you know, I, I said, I hope so. I hope that my faith in Jesus Christ is strong enough that it's somewhat threatening to the devil. It does some kind of damage. Here's what we've been saying. Jesus is my high priest. He is worthy of my gifts and submission. It's so easy to fall into routine and do the Christian basics and then to try to live our own lives. Nothing should compete with Jesus for our attention and devotion. We should examine ourselves. Am I truly a maturing disciple or a satisfied baby Christian, fat Dumb and happy. How, how many times have I talked to somebody and they say, oh, I'm just a baby Christian. And I'm thinking, but you've been at this for years. And it's almost like an excuse. It's like a shield. Don't expect anything of me. I'm just a baby Christian. Well, it's time to grow up. Amen. And so we're going to pray and if you need to repent and ask Jesus into your heart, I like to do this from time to time. I want to encourage you as we're praying to do that. Um, maybe what you need to repent of is complacency. And, and perhaps there's a need to rededicate to Christian maturity. And of course, we all need to ask Jesus to be our high priest. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, first, for those listening today, and Lord, they, they, they hear and they sense the truth of Jesus. And they're hearing this call that it's, it's not a cheap believism that settles quickly, but that it is a life and a growth and, and it is a, a, an ongoing relationship with you. And so they would say right now, dear God, Forgive me of my sins because Jesus bled and died for me and helped me to live well and grow in Jesus' name. Amen. Those that have prayed a prayer to that effect are now believers in Jesus. And I say hallelujah, and we praise you, Lord, for those that have done that. And, and, and then, Father, 
I, I pray what many of us have to pray and say, God, forgive me for settling, for being satisfied in my Christian faith. Whether I admit and call myself a weak baby Christian or, or whether I've moved a little further along and maybe I'm an infancy or a toddler or, or, or even in my early Christian education. And, but I've gotten, I've gotten slow and I've gotten comfortable and settled. God, forgive me for complacency. I love you, and so my desire should be to strive and grow in you. Uh, not of my own effort, Lord, but to know that I must keep progressing in you. And so, Father, we rededicate ourselves to Christian maturity. And above all, we declare that Jesus Christ is our one high priest, our one worthy appointed mediator between us and you, Father, and we thank you that Jesus is our high priest. He has forgiven our sins. And so long as we take the hand of our Lord and we walk with him, we will walk in victory. We will walk in his rest and we will make it to eternal glory and we will live with you forever. I'm not afraid of losing my salvation, but I know it is in you and not the doctrines of men. And so, O oh God, we give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.